Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Digital Marketing Therapy Podcast. I'm your host, Sammy Bedell Mulhern, and I'm excited to be here with you for another awesome episode. Today, I'm going to be talking with Christy Lawrence from My Time to Profit all about sales and messaging. And she drops some good stuff in this episode, you guys. I think you're going to love it. Some great things that you can take away and really execute in your sales strategy in 2020. But a little bit about Christy before we get started. She, like I said, is the founder of Time to Profit, and she has 15 years of PR marketing and sales experience with Fortune 500 companies, including Microsoft and Ford Motor Company. She has executed product launches for multiple biotech startups where she consistently finished in the top 1%. But the most important thing she offers is the passion for helping people succeed and making an impact with real measurable results. It's Amazing how your sales messaging in statements can really make an impact on how you close deals and how you benefit your customers. So it's awesome that she's here today to talk with all of us about how to craft your messages and why they're so important. But before we get into it, this episode is brought to you by the Business Accelerator. I'm hosting co-hosting a workshop in Bend, Oregon, January 10th to the 11th with Christy as one of the teachers, as well as Megan Freeze and Christy Starr. And if you listen to last week's episode, you can get to know them all and learn a little bit more about the Business Accelerator. But this is a day and a half workshop where we're helping you with the four pillars to break through your profit plateau to help you really kick butt in 2020 and get things moving. You can learn more about this at businessacceleratorbend.com. So if you're in the Pacific Northwest or plan on being here in January, definitely check it out. We're super excited about it. Again, businessacceleratorbend.com. Let's get to it. You're listening to the Digital Marketing Therapy Podcast. I'm your host, Sammy Bedell Mulhern, and each week I bring you tips from myself and other experts, as well as hot seats with small business owners and entrepreneurs to demystify digital marketing and get you on your way to generating more leads and growing your business. Hey, Christy, welcome back to another episode of Digital Marketing Therapy. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me, Sammy. Yeah. So Christy was on last week's episode, if you checked that out, where I introduced you to all of my business besties. But I wanted to bring you on today to just talk a little bit about sales and marketing specifically, because one of the things that you and I have aligned with a lot is how the two don't work without, like one doesn't work without the other. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And so one of those things that really ties that all together um, is messaging. And so I just wanted to start off by why do you think that messaging is such a key component um, and how does that differ between sales and marketing? So that's such a great question. And I think there's more similarity between messaging and sales and marketing than there is differences. But really, messaging is how you speak your customer's language and how you engage with them. And we live in a world where there is so much noise. We're constantly inundated with information and there's so many distractions. And so having something where you can very clearly say, what you do and why it matters, but even more important than that, that you can clearly say, this is who it's for so that your audience and your customers can hear it, helps you to break through that noise and connect with the people that you wanna work with. And I would say to your question about the differences between messaging for sales and marketing is marketing messaging is really about trying to draw people in and get them to take action, right? Like where you're attracting them, where around sales, your core message is the same, but the way you talk about it is much more directive and you're basically leading them down the path and telling them exactly what the next steps are and asking them to make those steps versus here's what you do and hoping they do it. So, Let me give you an example about this. I think one way to think about it is, you know, when you go to like a fancy event and they have people walking around, servers walking around with hors d'oeuvres, it's the difference between like marketing to me is you're walking around with the hors d'oeuvres, right? And you're like hoping that people are like, oh, it's beautiful, right? I want that. Where the sales part of that then is saying specifically, would you like an hors (laughs) d'oeuvre? This is what we have. Right. That's a great image, like way to pull all that together to make it, um, 
makes sense for people. And both are important, right? Like you don't want the people at the event asking you every two seconds if you want an hors d'oeuvre. But sometimes when you're starting out or you're maybe you're hungry and no one else is eating, them asking you directly makes it easier for you to take the action to get the order if you want without feeling awkward or weird or unsure. So the other example that I will use is if you think about like shopping for retail, like if if you've done the marketing, you've got, you got people in the door, right? So I walked into that store because I think they have something that I might want. But have you ever had those moments where you walk into a store and you know you're ready to spend money, you just need somebody to help you, but nobody greets you? Yeah. And so you don't spend the money because nobody actually pulled you through that experience. And then on the flip side where you've had, you walk in the door and they bombard you with every single thing, like every two seconds and you don't buy anything because they're being too aggressive. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. If without, you still need people to walk in the store. And that's where I think a lot of people either rely a hundred percent on marketing for their small business or a hundred percent on sales. And the truth is they work together that marketing makes sales easier. It builds familiarity. It builds trust. It gets people starting a conversation. But if you don't do the part, you bring all these people to the store but then you don't have that sales component built into your planning and how you're approaching your business. You've spent a lot of money and effort to get people in the store that may not end up making a purchase. Yeah. And do you think that some of that is because sales to, to a smaller business owner who maybe only has two employees or themselves in a VA or whatever to, to do both at the same time, feels overwhelming as opposed to putting those strategies together and utilizing the same outlets to serve both purposes? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a little bit more complex than that. I think that's definitely a component that, you know, one of the challenges every business owner faces when you're starting out is bandwidth, right? (laughs) Being able to scale and having a time to do all of the things and wearing all of the hats. But I also think that because of the way that social media has changed the marketing landscape, that marketing is more, is easier than ever before from the standpoint of accessibility, that you can Mm -hmm. go on Facebook, you can reach thousands of people. And there's a lot of noise around that. And it's a lot easier sometimes to sit behind your computer and post on social media consistently, which is definitely a part of your marketing strategy. And I'm not saying not to do those things. Those things are really important. But then actually taking that and going out and having conversations with people at a networking event, having a strong call to action on your website, actually, when you have somebody you're talking with, asking them directly, is this going to work for you? Is this something you feel like would help? Here's how you get started. There's a lot of misinformation about that sales is slimy or manipulative. And also, so that's one reason I think. And then another reason is that um, people are scared of it, right? It's intimidating. They don't know how to do it. And so it's easier to just there's so much information about marketing. Let me just do that and not have to learn this other thing. What are your well, thoughts I, on that? Yeah, no, I think what you're saying is it, it is easier to do marketing right now for sure, um, but it's also noisier. And yes. so the point is if you're doing those, if you're doing the things well where your people live, so whether that's picking one social media channel and like really knocking it out of the park as opposed to trying to do all of them, um, once you garner that attention, if you don't have the sales side of the funnel built in to draw them then into your website or into your store, or, you know, you meet them at a networking event and they say, I've already seen your stuff. Um, If you don't have that other piece, then you've wasted all that effort because now you've got their attention, but you have nothing in place to actually close that deal. And that's where I feel like sales is more important now than it has Mm -hmm. ever been before because it's a way to break through directly through the noise and have one-on-one conversations with your prospects versus just bombarding a mass audience, which is what most people are doing. And I'll use this example. Um, Sammy, you know the story, but... uh, Right. So maybe six months ago, I was trying to clean out my email list and I accidentally deleted my entire email list (laughs) that I had built over like 
three to four years. And I'm like, okay, great. So now I'm starting over with this part of my business. And, you know, one way to do that is through social media content and ads and landing pages. And I was doing all of those things and slowly getting traction and signups. But then I was talking to somebody and they were like, why not email like people that you know and friends of friends and ask them directly if they want to sign up to your newsletter. And I did that. And it's like I doubled the size of my newsletter list by reaching out directly one on one with a clear action, asking call to action in a week. Wow. Wow. And I think to me, that's the difference. Like people are like, even if they're interested, we're busy. So marketing is much more passive than sales. Does it mean it's better or worse, but it requires people to stop what they're doing and take an action where in sales, oftentimes you're kind of interrupting people. And so that you're asking them to take an action versus hoping they are incentivized enough to take action. Right. It's really kind of the inbound versus outbound yeah. philosophy. And I think whether you're whatever you're doing in sales and marketing, both are um, important. And I want to touch on kind of bringing it back to the messaging piece as well, because like what you're saying, sales is more disruptive. It's more kind of making that specific ask and getting Mm -hmm. them to kind of sign on the dotted line in different forms or whatever. But what I love about your approach is the way you use messaging turns sales into a positive conversation as opposed to that um, spammy kind of used car salesman piece. So I was wondering if you could kind of touch a little bit about um, your philosophy on that. So I think the fundamental thing to think about as you're developing your sales messaging is that ultimately the goal of sales isn't to get people to buy your product or service. And I think that like, That sounds so counterintuitive to people like what, but what it is actually the primary goal is to check for alignment and fit. And so what that means is how do you help people decide as easily as possible if your product or service is right for them and if it's not, because you want to filter out the people that it's not right for versus trying to convince them that it is right for them. Right. No, that's an interesting, I think it's an important just, or not justification, differentiation to make. Um, And I just want to say that again, like the point of sales is not to get people to buy the thing. Like that's, I think if you go at it with that frame point, you're going at it with your customer in mind, as opposed to that, because the desperation comes through, right? Like when you're pushing somebody to buy something or to like close right now, people feel that energy. Absolutely. And the truth is that you're not, your product or service isn't right for everybody. You know, there are people, um, I am actually doing sales for a client, consulting client that I work with, where I actually am not, I'm helping them build their strategies, but also doing sales for them. And there are times I'll be talking to a prospect and what they're telling me, I'm like, our product or service isn't the best option for you, given X, Y, Z scenario. Mm-hmm. And there's so much power in that from a standpoint of leadership where you can say, okay, you know, after our conversation, this isn't probably the right fit. And how then down the road, if it is the right fit, they are so much happier to do business with you. Yeah. And to make a referral to their colleagues and other people that they know who might be a good fit. Yeah, that's a great point because they feel like they were taken care of by you. Even if you're saying no, like we're not the right fit, then I mean, how many other people come to their door and say, and just push, 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 because they just want the sale regardless of if it works or not. And those long-term, those relationships I find long-term are either the most problematic or they're, they end up unhappy. So then you're going to get a negative review or negative referral from them in the future. Yeah. Um, So you're putting, you're playing the long game. Exactly. And what you said is so important that like, if you have to convince somebody to buy your product or service and you do that through pressure and they're not, it really isn't the best fit for them and they're uncertain about it, but they felt that kind of pressure. They 
then ultimately they are not going to be a happy customer. They are going to be a high maintenance customer. They're going to be a customer that complains about you to you. It's you're not doing your business any favors in the short term. And that is such a shift for, I think, how a lot of people think about sales where it's about always be closing. And, you know, I always say never be closing, but Mm -hmm. all of this is so important in how we frame our messaging, because when we approach our messaging from the standpoint of how do I help my prospects decide if this is going to help them solve the problem that I can help them with? The way you talk about what you do is going to be fundamentally different than if it's how do I get people to buy this? So how, when you sit down with a client or a potential Mm -hmm. client and you're having a conversation with them about their product or their service and and their goals and who their ideal customer are, is, ideal customer is, and, um, (laughs) Good English. And you, this, cause this happens to me all the time and they say, oh, well I can, I, my product is for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, You can't craft messaging around that. So what are kind of some things that you recommend people think about when they're, when they, cause it could be that it's for everyone, but you can't sell to everyone. Yeah. And ultimately it's never for everybody, right? It's not for like, maybe it's not for infants. Maybe it's not for people who have bad credit. Like, so it really doesn't, it, there's nothing that's really truly for everyone other than maybe oxygen and water. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But uh, even with water, it's different because some people have an affinity for plastic bottles and some people only want to use glass and some people only want to have filters. Like even within that, there's several different niches. And so I feel like if people are stuck on that, where they're saying, okay, I, they're having a hard time narrowing it down. The questions to ask, that I'm always thinking about are, okay, who can benefit the most from this, Mm. right? Who is going to get the best value, the biggest bang for your buck? And then from there, who is going to get the least amount of value from this? Who is going to maybe struggle with it the most? Who's going to maybe feel like, oh, that kind of helped me, but not a lot, right? So who's the best and who's the worst and who are you most excited to serve in that? What gets you fired up? And I think when you can start to answer those questions, you can start to hone in on this. And I oftentimes use the analogy, what you're really trying to do is get so clear. So you've probably heard me say this before. I might've even said it on our last podcast, but really thinking about messaging that you want to say your prospect's name, that when you're at a restaurant, for example, and it's noisy and it's busy, which is the world we live in yep. and people are talking and if they're like, Hey, you or whatever, You might not even hear that, but all of a sudden, have you ever been in a, like on a crowded street and you hear your name in conversation and it might not even be somebody who's talking to you. They might be talking to somebody who has a similar worksheet or Mm -hmm. similar name. Um, And then all of a sudden you hear everything that they're saying. Yeah. That's what we're trying to do with our messaging. And so really kind of thinking about who can you best, who's best going to benefit, who's going to be least likely to benefit. And then really start asking yourself what I mean by this is the reason they're going to, and just keep asking yourself who and why until Mm -hmm. you bring it down to a very specific audience. Well, and then this goes back to something you touched on at the beginning or, you know, about bandwidth and time as a newer business or a growing business, the more specific you can be with this and the more targeted you can be with those businesses you choose to go after because now you know who your ideal client is, you know who you don't want to work with, and it can kind of tighten that whole sales process a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to tell you too, Sammy, um, I do have a messaging worksheet that I have my clients oftentimes go through. I can um, send that to you if you want to put it in the show notes for people. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yes, let's absolutely do that. Because I know Christy walked me through this exercise what, a couple months ago, a month ago. And I, she knows my business very well. I know my business very well, but I don't always know the words to use to talk about, like to translate that message across. And so it's super helpful to have those kind of prompts and phrases to be able to think about. Um, It's not just enough to say, I sell this, right? Like I sell digital marketing courses. Great. Like everybody in the world has a digital marketing course, but to talk specifically about who the audience is that I want inside of my program, because I'm trying to build a community in, you know, an environment that's conducive to the types of people I want to work with. Um, 
And so I think that messaging sometimes feels a little fluffy to people, yeah. um, but can be a make or break, especially um, when you're in talking one-on-one with somebody, having those key messaging points, maybe you can talk about that a little bit, having those key messaging points and understanding the pain points to be able to um, really clearly share that right away. Yeah. And one thing I want to add on that is, you know, if you download the worksheet or you're thinking about this is actually have go through it with somebody who's not in your industry that you trust, because sometimes we're so close to our business that we're speaking in jargony words that don't mean anything and we don't even realize it. So um, I'll just use an example. I have a client in the insurance business and I was working with one of their team members on really delivering clear proposals that are compelling. And, you know, they're saying, well, this is the best policy because it's a comp, you you have comprehensive coverage and the extended replacement cost is hundred percent. I'm like, I don't, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. But when you've been saying it over and over and you know it so well, you're like, of course, everybody knows what this means, but your prospects don't. And so you want to like, make sure every single word of your messaging is in your prospects language, not your industry language. Yeah. That's, that's a hard thing to think about. I have had that happen to me several times where I think I've dumbed it down and then I get an email back from somebody like, what is this? Like, what does this mean? And so the, you know, the way to circumvent that is you can't unknow what you know. Right. And so if you can just call them like a friend, a family member who has no idea what you do and read them their mess, your messaging and then have them repeat it back to you. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's good. You're going to get a lot of insight on, is this really in my prospects language? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's like a straight up therapy strategy. <laughs> yeah. You try that with your spouse too. What did you yeah. hear me say? So what I hear you saying is, yeah, (laughs) I love it. Okay. So you've got the worksheet that people can download. Um, what are some other kind of like, you know, once you've kind of worked, maybe worked through the worksheet, you worked through it with a friend. Um, and now you've kind of got this mountain of stuff. Like, do you have a way that you like to tackle rewriting things? Like, is there somewhere you like to start first? Is it with the pain points? I mean, I think ultimately this sounds so simplistic. Yes, we want to get the pain points down. Yes, we want to say the client's name down. But where I feel like people actually struggle the most is explaining what they do and why it matters. Like your elevator pitch. Yes. Yeah. In a way that, and to think about this, that the goal isn't to use the messaging to convince them to buy your product. It's Mm -hmm. to start a conversation. Yeah. And so if you can't get what you do and why it matters, clearly it doesn't matter if you're saying your prospect's name. It doesn't matter if you're hitting on their pain points. Nothing else matters. Right. So and it's just also to, like you said, start a conversation and maybe get them in. Because you'll know right away if you can say it in a way that's intriguing, if they're interested in learning more or not. Yes. And, you know, we talk about this a lot, like when you're actually having sales conversations. So whether that's, you know, via email, but one on one or via the phone or at a networking event or when you're delivering a proposal, really the most powerful part of your messaging isn't in what you say. It's in the questions that you ask. Mm. Yeah. And I think that is probably another differentiator between sales and marketing that sales, when you're actually having a sales conversation with somebody, it's much more interactive from the sense that you can ask a specific question to one person and then address that question. So I always say, once you have your key messages done, what are the questions your client needs to be answering for those messages to have residents. Right. So for yeah. example, what? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, for example, like for me and my business, I might say, you know, what I do is I help small business owners generate more consistent revenue in their business to support their growth. And I do that through teaching them sales strategies and sales skills. Mm-hmm. Well, that's all good and well, but ultimately saying, okay, 
you know, what have you been doing so far to proactively generate more leads in your business? You know, how consistent has your revenue been for the last 12 months? What's worked in your business? You know, what hasn't worked in your business? Now all of a sudden we're having a conversation versus me telling them information. And you're gathering a lot more information about their business than you would have if you just were sharing what, what it is that you do. And then I can customize my messaging. So, you know, what I hear you saying is that you've been really struggling where you'll have three really good months and then two months that aren't, you know, that you really struggle. And so when you get busy, what are the strategies that you're doing to continue to generate momentum on the sales side while you're in execution mode? Well, they might say something like, Oh, I don't have any. Okay, right. That's something we can help you create. So now I've just transitioned into a sales conversation, but without talking about my business at all. Yeah, no, that's so good. And it's personal. So they feel like you're talking to them about them in their personal situation, yeah. as opposed to just creating some sort of cookie cutter explanation. Yeah, absolutely. So when we think about kind of the key messaging points for our business, how many do you think we should have? So I think you should have one core message. That's kind of your big, like, this is what we do. And then underneath that, no more than three to five kind of support points. Right. Cause you want to be able to just spout these off wherever you are with whatever makes the most sense for the business. Yeah. And the other piece um, that I also want to touch on with that is Uh, just because you might have these four or five key messaging points, it doesn't mean that you shut out every other conversation that's kind of on the periphery, right? There still might be other people that come across your path that are still good sales prospects for you. Uh, Absolutely. And, and, you know, I use the analogy a lot. Like if you think about your bullseye, all of your sales and marketing messaging should be directed into the bullseye. But you are going to get people in all the different circles of the bullseye. Now, if people are off the board, they're probably not a good prospect. Mm -hmm. But when you speak to the bullseye, it makes it easier for everyone else who are in those other outer circles to hear what you're saying Mm -hmm. and to identify themselves in it. Right. Well, especially as you build that referral network, you know, you know, those people that are coming to you are may not even have heard your messaging before, but they've been clients or customers of yours. They've bought your product or service. And so they're, they're sharing your message and that just widens that circle. Yeah. And people start thinking like, well, this sounds great. I know I'm not exactly who, you know, doesn't fit a hundred percent, but maybe she can help me or maybe this would work for what I'm doing. Yeah. That's awesome. So, um, what else do you think on the sales side of things that like people kind of struggle with or miss the mark when they're um, getting ready to start talking with people in those one-on-one conversations? Probably the mo- the biggest thing is saying too much. Yeah. And well, then- you and I have talked about this and I just did it, but you and I have talked about this, like being okay with that awkward yeah. pause. Yes. And I always like, I tend to start very broad. And I would say never say more than two to three sentences in a sales conversation before you pause. And sometimes there will be an awkwardness, but then you can just say, you know, what are your thoughts? Or have a specific question. But too often people spend too much time explaining what they do and why it's important and not enough time listening and engaging. Mm -hmm. And so say it, say it straight, and then shut it. (laughs) (laughs) Shut it. Well, give them time to process. And um, one of the lessons that I learned when I was first starting to write proposals is um, people don't care about necessarily how you're going to solve the problem. Like, especially for me, Mm -hmm. like they don't care about what tech I'm going to use. They don't care what plugin I'm going to use. They just want to know that I understand their problem enough Mm -hmm. and that I feel comfortable that I can provide them a solution. So giving them the solution as opposed to the tactics, like the strategies for how you're going to do it. They don't, yeah, they don't care about that. And people will ask questions, right? Like oftentimes I will say, you know, it sounds like so far that this is, you know, really going to help you. What other information do you need before you would feel comfortable making a decision? That way they can tell you what they need versus you boring them with information they don't care about and losing them in the process. 
Yeah. So I think the big takeaway from kind of the last two things we've been talking about is really just ask questions yeah. and then shut up and let them answer. Yeah. Um, that sounds but, so mean, but <laughs> no, it doesn't. It it's too, like, oh. yeah, <laughs> it's so good. Listen more than you speak because, you know, you're trying to enter into a relationship and give them value. You need, I mean, there's, I mean, there's, 50 people that do what I do in our, in our small town. There's like, I mean, they can find anybody that does what you or I do anywhere. Yeah. So it's all in how you treat your potential customers and clients. That makes the difference. Absolutely. And then my second thing I would say on that, or third thing, depending on where we're at (laughs) is don't be afraid to give them a specific next step. Don't wait for them to say, I want to do this. How do I sign up? Because a lot of times I think that's where people start to get like, ah, okay, we've had this great conversation. They seem interested. We're waiting for our prospects to be so excited that they ask us how to work with us. It takes vulnerability to ask for help. And so Mm -hmm. as a business owner, you need to take that off their plate and make it easy for them. And it doesn't have to be like in a sleazy, slimy, aggressive way. It simply can be like, is this what you are looking for? Would you like to move forward? Okay, if the answer is yes, here's the next steps. And I always use the phrase, here's what I propose. It's very soft. It gives people the permission to say, that doesn't work for me. It's just a proposal. You know, here's what I propose. It sounds like this is a good fit. Would you agree? Yes. Okay, so here's what I propose. I'll send over a contract on this day, and then we can start our engagement on XYZ day. Does that work for you? One of the phrases that I'm trying to get away from that I've noticed I say a lot is you should. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't mean it from a, in in a negative way, but I just, I feel like it would be better. Just like you said, I propose or one of, one of what I've seen be successful in the past or a recommend. I don't even, I don't even think recommendation, but I notice I say you should a lot and that feels very aggressive. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to work on pulling that out of my vernacular when I'm, it's not even when I'm pr- like working on proposals, a lot of times just when people are asking for advice and stuff and I say, mm-hmm. you should, like, you should do yeah. this. Cause then it's like, if you don't do it, then you like, you're, you don't respect me or something. Yeah. And nobody likes to be shitted on. No, <laughs> that sounded almost bad. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I love it. I'm entertained. Yeah. <laughs> Well, okay. So the other thing I want to say about messaging and have you touch on before we wrap this up is it's not going to happen correctly the first time around. Oh no. And it's, even if it's amazing, you're going to learn as you're doing client work. Like I am always tweaking my messaging and I'm going now, I think I want to caveat this, but it will evolve over time and it's okay to change it. And, you know, I'm looking at my messaging right now for my business. What do I want to keep? What's working? where are some nuances, but I will say this, you are going to fatigue of your message much faster than your prospects are because you are living and breathing it every day in every conversation. And so I think it's important to, when you come up with some messaging to stick with it for, you know, three months at a time to get real feedback from the market So you're not changing it every two weeks. Now, if you're making small tweaks or you learn something new that's like a pivot point, absolutely. But to be conscientious that it's never going to be perfect. It's okay to make adjustments. But are you adjusting because you just haven't had enough time to get the real feedback versus because you've learned something that's going to make it stronger? Does that make sense? I love Yes. And this is so important on both the sales and marketing side because... um, you know, the old saying is what people have to hear your message or see your brand six or seven times before they even remember you exist. Mm -hmm. And so even in your social posts or your email, like whatever you do, like we'll have several podcast episodes about similar topics. They're not exactly the same, but they're similar. So you, you have to almost put your message out there like 50 to a hundred times now before somebody's even going to see it seven times, just the way the algorithms work. And so I just, I think it's really important what you're saying. Um, and then 
tracking and testing on both the sales and marketing side. I ran this Facebook ad with this message and um, two different messages, but the same image. And this one performed better. Well, why did it do that? Or Mm -hmm. I used the same messaging in six different proposals. And then I used a little bit of a different messaging in six more proposals. These ones had a better closing rate. Okay. So what, you know, what is it about and paying attention and testing intentionally so that you know what to tweak and you're not just throwing darts out there to see what happens. Yeah. Or it's not like, Oh, right. And then every time someone hears like, what do you do again? Like, it's kind of different. Like, right. Okay, like just stick with it, then get the feedback, then make an adjustment, stick with it, mm-hmm. then get the feedback, then make an adjustment. Well, because the other big mistake I see with a lot of, and myself included, but a lot, especially people that have just started out is you get out there, you start to put your name out there, you start to get feedback and one person will say something. And then all of a sudden you're tweaking your entire strategy because of one person's response. And they might not even be your ideal client. And so be really cognizant of who's giving you that feedback. Yeah. And should you take it or not? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's one of my favorite things. Christy always says to me, are you open for feedback? (laughs) It's great. You got to have those people in your life. And you also have to take the feedback, like you said, and run it through a filter of, is this one person? Does this resonate with me? Yeah. Like, is this the appropriate feedback? Yeah. A hundred percent. Well, uh, Christy, I think you've given us a lot of things to think about and, um, I'm excited to get that worksheet out to everybody so they can start cleaning up and working on their messaging as well. Um, but any last words, otherwise, uh, I'd love for you to share where people can find out more information about you. Yeah. So my biggest thing that I want to say is just take the time to really be curious about your business. When you're thinking about messaging to try as much as possible to get rid of everything you know and you think to be true and just come at it with an open mind and then be willing to make adjustments along the way. Um, And if people want more information, I've got tons of resources around sales from sales planning tools to sales messaging worksheets on my website, mytimetoprofit.com. Again, that's mytimetoprofit.com. Perfect. We'll link all of that up in the show notes as well. Um, Christy, thank you so much for coming on this podcast. You're welcome. Really it's it. always great to chat with you. Yeah, it's super fun. So awesome. Have a great rest of the week. Yeah, you too. Bye. Big, big thank you again to Christy for joining me on this episode. I talk to her often and even in that case, I still walked away with some amazing ideas and insights from this episode. So head on over to the show notes at thefirstclick.net forward slash 39 and get the show notes and get the worksheet that she talked about. Um, It's awesome and will really help you refine your messaging. So thank you again for listening to this episode. Um, I would have anything if it wasn't for you listening on the other side. So I do hope that you'll subscribe wherever you listen so that you don't miss out on a single episode. And I'll see you in the next one.